Hi, I'm Casey Mann, uh, and thank you, Raja and Mike, for organizing this. Uh, Len and Kurt for sponsoring New School. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, as Raja mentioned, I am the uh, Director of Design Technology uh, at Carrier Johnson Plus Culture. For a little background, Carrier Johnson is an architectural planning, urban design, branding practice uh, that's existed in San Diego. Uh, recently expanded into Los Angeles. Uh, we have work, very diverse work across many typologies, both locally uh, around the United States as well as abroad. Um, so that's just some of our work. Um, but I'm here to talk about how we use technology in the practice. So in 2014, uh, we formally sort of established the design computation group uh, through acknowledging that there's new technology that are impacting the way that we practice every single day. And if we're not ahead of it, then in practice, we're 10 steps behind uh, all of our new employees that come out and know this stuff and want to use it in, at work. So in practice, uh, we sort of identified three focus areas being geometry, simulation, and visualization. Uh, and so that is like a super broad thing. Uh, so to sort of give you an idea of what that actually means in practice. It means everything from BIM management to cost estimating to life cycle cost analysis of materials and projects, uh, as well as parametric modeling, algorithmic workflows. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today is the way that we're using immersive environments and gestural controls uh, in the practice um, to sort of give us uh, a way of recontextualizing and reinterpreting the way that we think about the design of spaces. So I'm going to start. I think that it's really important uh, for me and for the practice that we understand the sort of philosophical underpinnings as to why we want to be engaged in an immersive environment. Uh, and for me, it sort of comes back to this one paragraph story by uh, Jose Luis Borges uh, from Del Rigor in La Ciencia, uh, which is translated to on exactitude in science. Uh, you can read the, the story, but in essence, what this story entails is the creation of a map that matches the scale of the world, right? And, and the distribution of that map across the plains, um, which is then left to be abandoned by future generations uh, and sort of crumbles into the desert. So what we're looking at is the sort of remnants of this map in the desert, right, as illustrated um, in Andrew Hurley's uh, translation. Um, and expanded upon this idea of the notion that we can produce a drawing that is the same scale of the world, right, is uh, in 1994, Jean Balderade, uh, who is a French philosopher, sort of reinterprets Borges' story to say that in Contemporary practice uh, in the digital environment uh, in the world as we know it now, uh, we don't actually inhabit the physical territory anymore. We now actually inhabit the map. Uh, and that the map is a sort of augmented way of understanding physical reality. Uh, and he sort of posits this notion and theory and, and coins it uh, simulacura, uh, um, which is also sort of um, linked to his ideas about hyperreality. So why does all of this matter and you know, why the sort of brief history lesson? Um, I think that it's super important for me and for us that we recognize in practice now we can use and have technology that enables us to actually understand what it means to be in the map or to be in the representation of the world at one-to-one -one before the map actually exists, right? So Prior to now, uh, we as architects and designers are only ever capable of understanding our projects at the scalar model or the scalar drawing, right? And so the, the interpretation is that through immersive environments and namely using virtual reality to create these immersive environments, that we actually can now inhabit our designs at true scale, uh, which sort of brings us in line with all of the other arts, right? painting, sculpture, people that are able to create their master works at scale. Uh, so in this way, we're using um, some of the technology that, that Ben talked about earlier, um, namely the Oculus Rift headsets, uh, as well as Google Cardboard, to sort of talk about um, the way that we can be in the space. And so 
what you're seeing here is the sort of split eye, left eye, right eye view that the, the head mounted display is actually in. And you can see one of our designers um, sort of walking around the project. And if you've had an opportunity to sort of throw the headset on uh, outside, this is the same project that you're walking through. And this is really meaningful for us um, because in practice, this means that we can create and iterate through design and evaluate um, not from the sort of tradition of representation vis-a-vis -vis plan section two-dimensional rendering, but we can actually evaluate the sort of phenomenological condition of a space uh, through the headset, right? So it's sort of like groundbreaking, uh, at, at least for us. Like, you know, the first moment that our design principles put the thing on and said, hey, can we move this wall? And the wall got moved and we, and we re-put it back into the virtual reality model and it was like, whoa, oh my God, okay, I understand that change now. Um, but like uh, Ben brought up earlier, um, you know, wanting to sort of show this to the client, right? Because in practice, this is sort of like a dangerous tool. If we, if we throw this headset on the client and we give them the Xbox controller and we say, walk around, like the first thing that they do is find something they don't like. It, inevitably, yeah, it, always. Uh, so, so we're using sort of mixture of platforms. Uh, and this is a little clip, um, actually sort of like of your mobile device. And so the Google Cardboard is out there as well with the little QR code to scan. Uh, and what this lets us do is we're using platforms that map uh, stereoscopic or equal rectangular rendering into a spherical space and then using the gyroscope in everybody's mobile phone in combination with a $10 piece of cardboard and some $4 lenses to sort of give you the immersive uh, photorealistic, if you will, rendered condition of a space, which clients tend to like really dig and, and buy a lot. Um, and this gives us the benefit of keeping them fixed in position and only showing them what we want them to see, uh, which is like a huge uh, deal for us. And so this is the split, um, you know, left eye, right eye again. Uh, and I encourage you to go out and, you know, throw your phone in um, in the cardboard and, and check it out. It's pretty amazing what you can do with your phone and that we don't need the whole Oculus Rift, you know, sort of package to put it together. Uh, but this is only sort of part of it, right? Part of the problem is in both of these environments, you've got this big mask on your face and you're sort of isolated from the actual world that you're sitting in. Um, and if any of you have ever experienced it, if you experience it outside, you could only imagine how difficult it must be to like hold a mouse and a keyboard and like actually try to do something uh, in this environment at the same time. So in parallel with exploring the virtual reality environments, we're also looking for unique and novel um, workflow interfaces, right? So uh, what you're seeing here, this little device down at the bottom is called a Leap Motion Detector, uh, or Leap Motion is the product. Uh, and what you're seeing is sort of is me opening and closing my hand, right? Moving it around in physical space and triggering changes uh, in geometry on the screen, right? So, you know, this is a pretty straightforward sort of proof of concept um, demo, uh, just a little grasshopper, right? Everyone's got the obligatory grasshopper thing going today. Uh, I like that on, on your slide. Um, and what this sort of means is that if we were to map the sort of ability to interact with and create geometry vis-a-vis -vis hand gestures, um, we no longer need to interface with the keyboard and the mouse in order to control geometry. Uh, so with that, right, the sort of in application is what does it mean to sort of have this Superman view of the model, right, of the city, of the context, uh, and to be creating geometry inside of it. And I think, you know, this photo is sort of like uh, uh, belies like the real actual complexities of doing this. Um, as you'll see in the, this is a proof of concept of actually using hand gestures to create the geometry from scratch, right? Um, it's shockingly difficult, uh, and, and the reason why there's no leap outside is because this is probably like take 20 of doing this. Um, and surprisingly, holding your arms out in space for like more than five minutes at a time is super uncomfortable and really counterintuitive. Um,
But I think that for me, it's not so much about saying, you know, this is the definitive way that we do this work, right? Or that we allow uh, ourselves and, and what you're seeing is sort of left eye, right eye again. So I am in, uh, you know, in this case, it's SketchUp, but it could be applied to any sort of platform. I am in the modeling environment itself in this video, uh, and I'm controlling the geometry by my right hand is actually controlling cursor position and my left hand through shortcuts like swipe left or like shake my hand or swipe up or make a little circle is triggering software shortcuts and that can all be programmed to whatever platform you're using. Um, but the interesting sort of moment for me was this realization that you know, we can cause this superimposition of a uh, non sort of traditional computational interface uh, in an immersive environment to physically or to virtually place myself in the model and create geometry, right? So one could imagine the application of this being, you know, a model of this space in the computer via the headset and deciding that, you know, this wall really needs to be five feet this way and by, you know, like, motioning that that wall needs to be five feet this way, it sort of pulls it. And if you've ever seen uh, income property on HGTV, I don't know if you know, right? But this guy sort of renovates apartments for, for people. He, they do this, like, he goes like, oh yeah, we're gonna have a wall here. And he like does it, and it's all done in post-production. And my point is like, why, right? Like, like we can do it, you know, here. Um, but I think there's, there's a ton of like problems with this also, right? The sort of, what's called the gorilla arm problem, which is holding your hands out in space for extended periods of time. We're not like built to do that. The interface really shouldn't be that, um, but I don't, you know, there's very few alternatives to that at the moment right now. Um, the software platforms themselves, hint, hint, Roger. Um, you know, both the Oculus as an immersive tool, right? Or the Oculus or the HTC Vive or whatever headset is coming out none of those tools are being absorbed into the platforms yet natively. So sort of seeing them in a virtual way is always sort of, uh, you know, two or three different softwares used in combination to actually make that work. And the same with the sort of other interfaces, right? Different scripts that need to be built into Grasshopper that control the camera location, that control the input of your hand and specific gestures is all stuff that we, that, you know, that right now, I'm programming, and in all sense of reality, like I'm not a programmer and I don't pretend to be one or even want to be one necessarily, but just by virtue of wanting this to work so badly, I've sort of figured out how to do it. Uh, and so I think the future of it is really as some of these platforms come online for real, like once Oculus is not a beta anymore, um, and once the leap sort of works some of its other issues out, I think right, the, the platforms here, and bringing it back to the Borges story, right, is we now no longer need to leave the map in the desert, right? And we also don't need to decide whether we inhabit the real world or the virtual world, right? But we actually get to inhabit Baldurat's hyper-reality. Uh, and so with that, I'll sort of you know, uh, leave it. Uh, thanks again to everybody for coming out today. Uh, appreciate it.